Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host. And today I have with me a very distinguished uh, soldier slash scholar, warrior scholar, Lieutenant General Sayyid Atta Hasnain, uh, who has served in Kashmir, uh, is a highly decorated uh, officer who has received uh, PDSM, UVSM, AVSM, SM, VSM, and the bar. I mean, the list of your <laughs> medals is, is uh, indeed quite impressive. Uh, and you have also served as uh, the military secretary, which uh, I understand is one of the top seven staff officers in the Indian Army, which is also responsible for actually most of the promotions and tenures uh, in, in the Indian military services. So we are quite... Uh, uh, honored to have you on the show, uh, General Saab. Welcome to Conversations. Thank you very much, Mukhtar Saab. It's a pleasure to be joining you on this program for the first time. Thank you very much. And this will not be the last time, in, definitely for sure. Uh, and I also want to thank you for your service. 40 years in the Army, uh, and people don't realize it, but uh, there are lots of uh, personal and individual sacrifices that are made uh, in the service of, of the country. So I am thrilled to have you on the show. Uh, we are going to start by talking about this article that you recently published in the, uh, the New Indian Express. Uh, you actually seem to write frequently for that. You have a column there and you're also the chancellor of uh, the Central University in Kashmir, as I understand at the moment. So, sir, in, in this article, you argue that terrorism has come back to Pakistan. Uh, and basically, you summarize the evolution of TTP from 2007, uh, since Musharraf entered uh, the Red Mosque uh, and, uh, and essentially triggered uh, a sort of uh, coalescing of all the jihadi groups inside Pakistan against the state of Pakistan, which ultimately precipitated the TTP. And now we have a situation where the Pakistani government feels the need to declare another war. So, so I would like to begin by quickly summarizing uh, who, who is TTP or what is TTP and why is it against the state of Pakistan? Because a lot of us have often heard that both the Taliban and the TTP are actually proxies of the government of Pakistan. So it, it is interesting that they have created their own Frankenstein. So could you just summarize to us who is TTP? What do they want? Let, let, me, begin, let me begin this by saying that till, the, till 2007, that's the entry into the Lal Masjid or the Red Mosque, we had never heard of uh, internal security issues as such in Pakistan except uh, the odd uh, groups such as the lashkar e or uh, some such groups which were anti-Shia in nature in particular. But suddenly out of the blue, you found uh, President Musharraf getting targeted by the jaish e and uh, perceiving that this issue of radical Islam, which had become virtually like a weapon system in Pakistan, commenced, to commence from the time of General Zia, uh, was going out of hand and it could pose a tremendous danger to Pakistan, which is why uh, President Musharraf uh, ordered the siege of Lal Masjid at that time, uh, particularly to make sure that all that was emanating from uh, the quarters of the Lal Masjid were neutralized. Uh, this became the start point of a campaign by uh, a club of organizations put together, led by the Tariq -e Taliban Pakistan. Um, the number of radicalized uh, clerics uh, who had actually the support of the Afghan Taliban. But by virtue of the fact that it was Afghan Taliban was so dependent on the Pakistan army and so dependent on the state of Pakistan itself, that they couldn't really openly express their support to the TTP. But the TTP clearly came into being as an entity to try and uh, bring about the caliphate, as it always happens with most radical Islamic organizations, and uh, bring uh, the Sharia uh, into Pakistan, and also ensure the release of uh, maybe 200 or 250 odd people who were at that time had been arrested uh, by the Pakistan security forces. And this is where the confrontation really started. It came to a head in 2014, when, uh, the, when the Karachi airport was attacked, and that started this operation called Zarbe Azb, uh, 
Mr. Pakistan Army launched, uh, I think the real flagship event in this entire process was the dastardly attack on the Pakistan Army Public School at Peshawar, which led to almost 133 young innocent children losing their lives. And uh, that has created an antipathy within Pakistan. Although there are lots and lots of groups in Pakistan, lots and lots of people in Pakistan who continue to support uh, the TTP. These are the elements, that's my last point here, these are the elements who also support blasphemy laws. They are the ones who support Mumtaz Qadri and people like that. This is an element of society in Pakistan which has been proliferating over a period of time, essentially triggered by the weaponization of Islam started by Jan Ziaul Haq. You know, sir, while I understand that Pakistan is a society where a large segment of the population is extremely radicalized. And so the gap between radicalism and, shall we say, terrorism is becoming narrow and narrow. So there's a, a great opportunity for these groups to recruit uh, from. But, but the whole idea of Pakistan was to, for Islam and Muslims, isn't it? Even today, Pakistani leaders brag that even Saudi Arabia was not created on la ilaha illallah, but Pakistan was created on this. So it, it is kind of counterintuitive, isn't it, that Islamist groups uh, are emerging uh, because they're unhappy with the Islamicness of Pakistan itself. Uh, and uh, and the thing is that, uh, like, is this the is the best way to understand is, is that it is a continuation of the civil war inside Pakistan, uh, to shape the identity of Pakistan, whether it will be a liberal democratic state or whether it will become an Islamic caliphate uh, like ISIS or Iran? That's a very, very interesting question that you have placed. And uh, it will, of course, force me to go back almost back to 1947-48. Uh, I think the intent here was never to create a, a radicalized state or something based on only religion. Uh, the vision which uh, Mr. Jinnah had was also, uh, Mr. Jinnah was known to be a, was known to be a person who was a liberal otherwise, but expressed his ideas politically at the end in a very, very radical manner, hoping to be able to bring together disparate elements within Islam in the, in the subcontinent and uh, bring about a clean, a cleavage between Hindu society in, and the Muslim society. The classic two nation theory, so to say. Uh, he died very early, of course. And then the struggle started. Essentially, the people who came out uh, from, from, the, uh, from the Indian heartland of uh, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Bihar and places like that, were the ones who brought in a very moderate form, what is called the Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb of uh, the Indian uh, subcontinent, the main mainstream subcontinent. The Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb was brought there. But uh, it is the Punjabi element, the, the, the Pashtun element, to an extent the Sindhi element, together, who possibly did not allow that kind of a culture to build in. And uh, this was very greatly assisted by the fact that Pakistan thought that it is better to look at the Arab world rather than look at the Indian subcontinent for its linkages. Primarily economic, I would say. In the beginning, Pakistan required funding. Uh, it became a natural partner of the United States. Cento Cito followed. And uh, the rest of it was, of course, in connection with the Middle East. That Arabization definitely helped uh, in bringing about the linkages. And when radical Islam started proliferating in the Arab world, it was a natural corollary that the same thing would happen uh, in Pakistan. And uh, of course, I think 1979, in my, in my research, 1979 is the most crucial year. The year when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, the year when the Iranian revolution took place. And that's the year when the, when the Grand Mosque was taken over by Day Kwan, if you remember. And this led to a, you know, a combination of uh, forces being generated together to try and ensure that Islam was saved 
it seemed as if Islam was under threat. And Pakistan always in the forefront, always looking to be the flag bearer, wanted to be there. The Islamic bomb was in the making at that time and Pakistan sort of thought it was an opportunity to assume the leadership of the Islamic world. That's what probably triggered Jan Ziaul Haq to commence this whole weaponization process. And that's the sorry state to which Islam came under his leadership and subsequent. You know, in your article, you make a very interesting point about the way the Sheba Sharif's government is approaching the challenge. And uh, you talk about their policy to deter dialogue and development, the three Ds uh, that they have proposed to deal with TTP. I, I thought they forgot the fourth one, the dumb part. <laughs> so this, this part <laughs> You know, uh, how are they going to deter a terrorist organization, see, unless there is a, a threat of retaliation by the state against, uh, the, the, there is a credible threat, uh, there is no way of deterring them. Uh, and the dialogue was was one of the reasons why when Imran Khan initiated the dialogue with TTP, and then it broke off after more than uh, a year and a half, I think. Uh, the, the the critics argue that it gave TTP the opportunity to 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 get their resources together to consolidate their position, and in the bargain they also got a few of their leadership who were in prisons in Pakistan to be released, and then they broke off the dialogue, which allowed them to essentially reconstitute themselves uh, in the now America free Afghanistan. Uh, so the biggest point that you make in that is that this whole business of dialogue and development will not work unless uh, Pakistan is able to diminish the kinetic capabilities of TTP in their, their capacity to actually uh, perform uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, so so, so you, you think that the current initiative that the Shahbaz Sharif and his cabinet have launched is going to fail? And what would be a better way to deal with TTP? Even in theory, the application of any kind of a strategy to deal with terrorism, even insurgency, always commences with the kinetic route. It doesn't start with engagement and winning hearts and minds, because the message has to be very clear that you cannot take the state for a right. This basic thing, I'm surprised that the Pakistan army chief with an infantry officer himself and must have participated in many such operations. He's uh, not capable of thinking of this. But to my mind, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan is becoming clearer by the day, is a proxy of the Afghan Taliban. And the Afghan Taliban is attempting at the earliest to detach itself from the past, of past linkages with Pakistan and actually become the, the prominent political Islamic element within this region, the AFPAC region. In other words, it is intending to try and lead, bring about its form of radicalized Islam into this entire AFPAC region. The Tariq Taliban Pakistan is the advanced party, the recce elements of um, uh, the Afghan Taliban, which is there in Pakistan at the moment. If Pakistan does not take this seriously enough, it doesn't rise to it immediately, it will get swamped. And that is a, and it's not an understatement, it will actually get swamped by it. Because as it is, there is a tremendous support for radical Islam within Pakistan, as I was already mentioned to you earlier, now with the TTP coming in. And I'm surprised why the Pakistan army is adopting this? Because they've experienced exile, or Operation Zarbiyat, uh, Radul Fasab, two operations which they have conducted and conducted it rather well, I would say. Although they came under severe criticism, international criticism, for using air power uh, against their own people in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area and places like that. But uh, nevertheless, they defeated the TTP. Uh, at least, if nothing else, they neutralized, may not have defeated the TTP, but neutralized it. The lesson which has emerged from it is very clear. Kinetic power in the initial part of a campaign is absolutely essential. 
but it must be followed up immediately or almost simultaneously by uh, military soft power and then by political soft power, social soft power. That uh, unfortunately, even the last time was not followed up sufficiently. Uh, this time, perhaps learning from those lessons, Pakistan is trying to attempt to do this. The second thing I think that Pakistan is trying to project is because of the pressure of the FATF yeah. just having come out of the grey list. It's probably perceiving that unless it follows a very soft route against the, and these elements in the beginning, uh, you know, it may get misreported that it is once again, you know, into the, into the whole game of supporting terror against terror and things like that. So uh, it's because of this, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that the Pakistani, that the Pakistan assembly is, has accepted this because uh, there are people there who know about it. Uh, there are, there are political leaders in Pakistan who are aware of this. It's not that awareness has not been there. So it's a fallacy which is being put around. I think it is not going to be seriously executed. On ground, probably the execution will continue through the kinetic road. Yeah, so uh, let me present a couple of alternative explanations to this. So one of the differences between the Pakistan of 2014, uh, which launched the massive military actions against uh, all the insurgents in the FA, uh, in the Fatah region, as well as Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, is and that today's Pakistan army is that there is a significant division inside the military itself. There are factions which are, you know, pro Imran Khan and those who are anti Imran Khan. So there is a division. So I'm not very sure whether the current uh, army chief of the Pakistani army chief Munir, uh, General Munir, is confident that his entire army is going to be behind him if he were to launch a massive kinetic operations against TTP. Because if you remember, the pro-Pak uh, Imran Khan element inside the Pakistani army uh, would have supported pa Imran Khan's policies towards TTP. They, I mean, he was often called as the Taliban Khan, if you remember, uh, and uh, and he he was the one who wanted to negotiate. He was the one who invited the TTP back into Pakistan. Uh, from Afghanistan after he became prime minister. So it is quite possible that the Pakistani you know, chief uh, does not feel confident that if he were to launch a massive attack uh, against TTP's bases, both inside Pakistan and inside Afghanistan, uh, he will have the backing of the army. And the other is a bit more, slightly more conspiratorial, is perhaps they are delaying military operations closer to October when they are constitutionally required to have an election. Uh, and the whole idea of delaying an election for fear that Imran Khan might, uh, Imran Khan is probably going to win the election easily if they hold. So if they have a massive civil war going on in the country, it will provide them with the reasons and justifications for not holding elections. Uh, uh, what are, What is your reaction to these theories? I will go along more with your first theory. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I endorse that virtually. I do have been studying what's happening within the Pakistan army. Uh, but somehow, I tend to believe that the Pakistan army's history at least shows that uh, the one thing which has characterized it is uh, its unity. Largely, is unity. That there have been divisions. Yes, there have been divisions in the past too. But whenever it came to a crisis, the Pakistan army was always united. But I do agree with you. Yes, there are a lot of rumblings taking place at the moment. And the kind of personalities that we've had as Pakistan army chiefs in the past, perhaps are there today. Jal Munir is, isn't in that class of personality. I would put Bajwa still at, in a very high class comparatively. Six years here. His kind of confidence, his body language, etc., is not something which Munir exudes uh, at the moment. I perhaps a little too early to yet uh, say it. But uh, yes, if there is, if there is sufficient evidence to say that there is a division within the Pakistan army which is serious enough, then obviously an army chief will 
treat this very, very gingerly and will not attempt to try and bring in uh, a kinetic uh, approach right at the beginning. Perhaps if I was in his place, I would attempt to do it in one or two sectors, not all out. Uh, um, um, the earlier operations were all out completely. No holds barred, air power used, tanks used and things like that. None of that. I would just attempt to bring in the Pakistan infantry, bring in a, a couple of paramilitary forces, experimentally in a certain sector, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or some place like that, and then go after them, right? Test it out in the field and see what is the response of the force elsewhere. This has to, this has to be done progressively. Yeah. Anything drastic in this manner is, is too sensitive a subject to, to actually go into it very, very drastically. Um, I shouldn't really be saying it, but I think most of us who know the Pakistan army uh, think of it as a very professional force. And uh, when it comes to a challenge, when it comes to the crunch, I don't think the Pakistan army will let down the nation, its nation. It will attempt to do everything. And uh, to that extent, I think it will remain united and go after the TTP. Although I'm fully aware that the radical element within the Pakistan army is still very high. Lots of efforts have been made by Pakistan and the Pakistan army. I'm aware of it because I have friends there who have told me that efforts have gone on. Uh, maybe not so successfully, but at least efforts have been going and are, are ongoing even now to try and de-radicalize, counter-radicalize uh, the elements who are, are already there within the army, who are spreading this kind of a, uh, ideology around. Given all this put together, I am I can foresee that Pakistan is heading for a period of reasonably serious confrontation. And uh, it is going to be something akin to Operation uh, uh, zarb azb although maybe not to that extent uh, right at the beginning. Uh, it may expand into it. The disadvantage this time is that uh, the TTP has safe havens available in Afghanistan. And that is a major advantage for it. Uh, there is a contentious issue which is built up on the Durand line. Uh, that itself is a major problem. So Pakistan has got it, the Pakistan army has got its challenges on its hands. But I do foresee that it will attempt very seriously to try and overcome them through the kinetic route. You know, when people talk about Afghanistan, they talk about ungovernability. And you also talk about ungovernable spaces uh, inside Pakistan. But what people often forget is that there's a vast swath of uh, area in Pakistan, which is also quite ungovernable in spite of its military operations. And, and what you're talking about in terms of going sector by sector, it's not going to be that easy. They go, let's say they go by, they take the map, draw it into various squares. They take, clear one sector, they need to hold it. Then they clear the next one. And then they need to hold these two sectors together and then keep going. And the problem is that, that uh, TTP now has strategic depth into, into Afghanistan. Uh, you know, uh, I often get requests from people to talk about the so-called Indian military doctrine of two and a half fronts, uh, where you have one front of China, one front of Af on Pakistan, and one front inside the insurgencies that Pakistan or t could basically trigger inside Kashmir. But Pakistan now has that same problem of two and a half fronts. They have India on their eastern front. They have now Afghanistan with the Durand line conspiracy, uh, controversy and conflict on their west and then TTP inside. Uh, uh, my, my question to you in this context is, shouldn't this incentivize Pakistan to patch up with India to keep the eastern front calm and quiet while it is engaged on the western front with both the Taliban's? Interesting, absolutely. And as to your theory of the two and a half front within Pakistan, I have written about this seriously, maybe for the last seven years. I have always mentioned this, that Pakistan has only three areas to look at. The Indian border, that's the eastern border, 
the Afghanistan border, there's the Western border, and internal security. It has to prioritize, it can't handle all three at any time, it can't even handle two of them at one time. It has to handle them one by one. And uh, therefore it has to prioritize. At the height of uh, Zarbe, uh, the highest priority was internal security. The second priority was Afghanistan. And the third priority was the Eastern Front, uh, was the Indian Front, where the ceasefire was very much in place, etc. Kashmir was not burning at that time. And suddenly opportunities came Pakistan's way in 2016. That is after Pathan Court, Uri, Nagrota, and incidents of that kind. And suddenly you found priority one becoming the Indian Front, priority two being the internal security, and priority three suddenly going towards Afghanistan. This is how this game has been played out in Pakistan all these years. Yes, what you say, it makes eminent sense that uh, Pakistan should be looking at uh, stabilizing or, if nothing else, uh, patching up with India. General, Zia, General uh, Bajwa spoke of this many times in his very famous Bajwa doctrine, which really was never a doctrine. It was just a, it was just a, a an interview with the media which took place in Rawalpindi uh, at a particular given time, I think in 2016 or early 17 sometime. But it turned out to be the Bajwa doctrine because he spoke for the first time you found an army chief coming out and speaking about peace with India. It was not like, uh, somehow the Pakistan army and the deep state at which we talk about in Pakistan, which is um, deeper than most deep states anywhere. It is, it goes against the interests of the deep state. And what is in India always analyzed is that we are aware of the perks and the privileges, um, the financial emoluments, etc., which are enjoyed by elements of the deep state who want this state to perpetuate what is happening with India to perpetuate. 2021, when uh, 25th of February, when the ceasefire came into being, this the eleventh ceasefire I've seen from 26th of November 2000. Three, when, when, when I was in Kashmir, two as a brigade commander, and then the 25th of February 2021, the ceasefire came once again. That has helped Pakistan. It has helped Pakistan tremendously. At most of these times, if you really see, India has been very cooperative. Uh, when when uh, major problems have taken place internally within Pakistan, India has never attempted to raise the temperatures on the line of control. That unfortunately is not the case with the deep state. I'm not talking about Pakistan, I'm saying deep state. In India, it is very clear, the Indian policy is very clear. We deal with the state of Pakistan, the government of Pakistan. It is the business of the government of Pakistan to, to get us act together. The deep state or the deeper state or the deepest states can all be put together. And it is the Pakistan state with, with which we will do anything, do any business. To say that there's a certain element which is not listening to the Pakistan state, there's a certain element which is not under their control, that is not the business of the government of India. The government of India is the one which is being targeted, the Indian army is being targeted. And our response will be accordingly. The response will be calibrated as you've seen. In this particular case, you can make out very clearly the response has not gone. But the last time it happened with the with the Uri strike, when it happened with the with the Pulwama strike, uh, the response was almost immediate. It went within less than ten days. So we will see how it happens. But I do not foresee a change in policy uh, of the Pakistan government for one particular reason. As my final point on this issue. Most of the elements of the deep state think Pakistan has invested too much in Kashmir, 30 years, 33 years and counting. It cannot hope to turn around, turn back now. Things can be quietened. The LICO, the low intensity conflict can, can, can take a back turn, but it is still there. It's still there. It's a very com old common saying that uh, LIC does not go away until it actually goes away. We all keep imagining that LIC has gone away. And this is exactly my point in, in Kashmir today. We have got a great advantage 
for India after the 5th of August decisions of 2019. But uh, this advantage can be fitted away. This advantage can be fitted away tomorrow if Pakistan chooses to once again commence a very uh, proactive kind of uh, engagement and strategy uh, against India in Kashmir. Stop that kind of... Uh naturally leads me towards this current uh, episode uh, with regards to the, the terrorist attacks uh, in Poonch, uh, in the Rajouri district. Uh, and uh, there are some questions come up. And one is that it is a spontaneous Kashmiri response to the G20 meeting in Srinagar, which is trying to send a message that Kashmir is normalizing as a result of the abrogation of the 30, 370 and 35A and that was a great uh, policy. And so, so to, to negate that narrative, th there is uh, emerging attacks in Kashmir, uh, in, in Kashmir in order to send the message that things have not normalized. But it, it does also appear that there was uh, some kind of participation by Jaish -e Muhammad in this operation. So how, what do you anticipate India is going to do? Is it going to treat it as a domestic terrorist attack and try and identify and find the perpetrators and prosecute them? Or is there going to be a Balakot-like uh, response? Um, and uh, as we get closer and closer to elections uh, in India too, uh, do you think that there is any connection to India's military options and the electoral politics of the country? That this uh, punch attack was connected to the G20, upcoming G20 tourism meeting in Srinagar in the third week, fourth week of May, and also perhaps connected to the Shanghai Cooperation meet, Conference meeting, organization meeting um, in Goa. Uh, I have no doubt about it. It's connected to it. And this is the history in Kashmir. We have, I write from Chitta Singhpura, we saw this in 2000 when um, Bill Clinton was to address the Parliament of India and 36 Sikhs were gunned down by the lashkar e Taiba, now known as the jamaat ud -Dawa. Uh So this has been the history. Every time such major events are taking place in India, you always find a sponsored strike taking place to draw the attention of the world. This is obviously connected in the same way to draw the attention of the world, to tell the G20, to, to tell everyone else that uh, uh, Article 370 or no Article 370, Kashmir is still not integrated with India and uh, that this campaign will go on. That's the story being sent out to the world. That's the story being sent out, the narrative being put out to the public in Kashmir that the war is not over, the, the proxy conflict is not over. Uh, having said that, I'm not one of those who would like to <coughs> operate on this, analyze and put pressure on the government of India through my analyses and my writings in any way. <coughs> I always know and I have full confidence in the fact that the government of India knows best how to respond, how to react. But under the circumstances at the moment, uh, seeing the fact that we are the chair of G20, there are important events about to take place. I'm sure we do not want, India may not want its borders at this time to be disturbed and therefore you may find that uh, what a lot of people are contemplating may be a, a, a kinetic kind of a response may actually not come about at this time. Uh, notwithstanding that efforts will be redoubled all over Kashmir, all over Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, also at the same time to ensure that these areas south of the Pir Panjal in particular, this Jammu region, Jammu, Rajori, Poncho region in particular, which have seen a, a, a surge in the recent past. Yeah. You know, we had similar incidents on the 1st, 2nd of January this year when seven, unfortunately, seven innocent Hindus were right. uh, killed by, by, by terrorists. And we, August... We've had a kind of a repeat which has happened here a number of times. This is the area, same area which is called the Hill Kaka area. From where in which the operations of the Indian Army were conducted in 2003. This is a tract in the high altitude areas of the Pir Panjal. It's very, very difficult to sort of search and very, very difficult to dominate. It's an ideal kind of territory for terrorists to have their hideouts. So, this is the kind of thing one strikes from now, if one, one strike a month or a strike in two to three months, is likely to take place to retain that significance and keep flagging 
to the world that the movement is still on. Uh, of course, the Indian efforts to continue uh, countering terrorism operations will double, will renew. But just sending across a kinetic response and hoping that that will act as a deterrence for further attacks on India by sponsored proxy elements, I don't think that's really going to work to, in this particular case. Nevertheless, as has been brought out by the Indian doctrine, by lots of Indian military leaders, there is ample space between the nuclear overhang and uh, the conventional to conduct operations. So far, we've just seen surgical strikes, very, very tactical, um, low level at the line of control. We have seen air strikes going to Balakot. There's a range, there's a spectrum of responses which is possible. And uh, uh, today's newspapers in India say that uh, there is a thing going around in the Pakistan army that General Bajwa has known to have admitted, have publicly stated that the Pakistan army is not a match for the Indian army, which is very, very true today, considering the fact that Pakistan's war sustenance capability today must be almost zero. With the kind of economy it has got, the kind of ammunition movement which has taken place from Pakistan to Ukraine to fight the war, I don't think Pakistan is in a position to be able to fight India should there be a conventional war today at all. Which is what leads me to somehow just question this whole thing. Why is Pakistan attempting to instigate, trigger a situation in which a conventional response from India may not be countered by Pakistan at all? Well, there are a couple of things. So, um, I, I do believe that there is a segment in the Pakistani government uh, which is trying its best to ensure that Imran Khan does not come back to power. And if, if launching a war against TTP or provoking India to, 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 to make a limited attack uh, uh, can serve that purpose, they might be interested in provoking that. But I also find that there is an element of, uh, uh, from a strategic foreign policy perspective, there is an element of counterproductivity to this sponsored attacks. So, for example, May 4th and 5th, we have the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's foreign ministers uh, meeting. Uh, and Bilawal Bhutto apparently is st still coming, at least the expectations are. But the SCO, the primary motivation for its coming into existence was to fight, uh, as the Chinese like to talk about, uh, extremism, really. Uh, uh, terrorism and separatism. So, I mean, it's a very good definition of uh, Kashmir problem for India. So, so suddenly the reason why SCO has come into existence is, is manifest in this attack in Punch. So, so for India, this is a very useful moment to drive home the point that the countries of SCO need to come together uh, to put pressure on Pakistan uh, and and help India combat this, this terrorist uh, attacks uh, that it is experiencing. So, so from every point of view, I don't think this is a very smart tactic. Uh, your thoughts on it, sir? I, I endorse uh, what, you, what you have said, entirely endorse that. Um, the SCO comprises of the prime elements of the SCO, of course, India, is there India, Pakistan, China, Russia, but it is Central Asia, the five Central Asian republics, 72 million Muslims who make up this part of the world, which is such an important part. One of the objectives of India in joining the SCO was the access to the, um, to the, to the Central Asian republics, hopefully through Pakistan, something which Pakistan has denied, or denied us for the last 31 years. But, uh, Hopefully, this will work itself out in the, in the future. But you're absolutely right. The SEO platform and that to the foreign ministers uh, summit is a very, very appropriate platform to bring these issues out, highlight the role of Pakistan. And let's see what Mr. Sh uh, Bhutto has to say uh, to this. It is my fear. It may be completely unfounded, but it is my fear that Mr. Bhutto 
may just make some awkward statements on Indian soil. <laughs> yeah, you can and, uh, <laughs> embarrass India to some to some extent. And India, as good hosts, may not uh, really do enough to be able to counter that. That is my that my that is my worst fear. But uh, I agree with you entirely. This is a great opportunity for India to showcase to them to to to, to the SEO what India itself is doing and how it is suffering. And the oldest sufferers from uh, radical extremism uh, is, are here in, the, in in this is India. It's, I mean, 9/11 came much much later. We have been suffering this for the better part of the last 40 years or more. Uh you know, I've been doing a lot of work on the Middle East for 20 years. And so my turn towards South Asia is more recent. So I was re I'm, so I'm reading a lot of India's history. And when I read about uh, what happened uh, about Kashmir, uh, the tribal, the tribe, uh, the Pakhtun tribes, which invaded Kashmir and triggered the first Kashmir war, it hit me that from its birth, Pakistan has been using proxies. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Go back to 47, 48. They were using proxies there while Jinnah was alive. So this whole idea of liberal democracy, I mean, we are being very polite by not labeling them as essentially terrorist groups which invaded Kashmir, you know, uh, uh, that. I want to go back and ask one more question about uh, TTP. And in a lot of the coverage, the not many people have noticed this, but if you look at all their targets, they're targeting the state of Pakistan. They're targeting the military and law enforcement agencies. They're hitting the army bases. They're hitting police. The, the, uh, they're hitting counterterrorism centers uh, in Peshawar and other places. And even when they were targeting in places like Karachi, they were trying to hit the state and the military. So in that sense, I think that the Pakistani government's message of trying to label TTP as a terrorist organization may not be resonating because it's not targeting civilians, it's targeting the state. So it's more of an insurgency than a, a terrorist organization. And in many ways, you sh we could actually think of it as a rebellion. You know, this is like a rebellion. And I think the Pakistani army should treat it as an insurgency and a rebellion in this response rather than to think of it as domestic terrorism or radicalism. I'm not sure I entirely agree with you on that because the history of the TTP shows that it has also been targeting a lot of Shia groups. Yeah. Um, and and uh, many of the major targets, uh, in which uh, casualties above, you know, 100 and above, have been essentially Shia mosques or have been Sufi mosques yeah. in many cases. So uh, it's not entirely, yes, they've targeted, you're right, uh, PNS Mehran, they've targeted the Peshawar Air Base, they've targeted the Pakistan, uh, the, the Karachi Airport, they've targeted the Frontier Force Rifles Regimental Center at uh, Peshawar. You are entirely right in your observations, a large number of military establishments, paramilitary establishments, but accompanying that, have been attacks on, on, on Shia mosques. And that is a distinct uh, act of terror. And even if they have um, been targeting military establishments, in most of these establishments, you will also find that they've had no remorse about targeting families, etc. I mean, the, the flagship event was the, yeah. as I said, was the uh, army yes. public school attack in 2015. So I would not, I don't think it would go down very well within the Pakistan army to try and treat this as a counterinsurgency or a coin kind of an operation. It should be treated as a purely counterterrorist kind of an action. And if it's a counterterrorist action, then I'm surprised that the Pakistan army chief is talking about deterrence and um, things of that kind, you know, the three Ds and things of that kind. It is essentially kinetic right in the beginning. It's only when you reach the threshold of, th of, of, of uh, neutralizing the, the capability of the adversary, it's only then that you take on the softer measures. One of the biggest difference in, in the way the U.S. was attacking uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda as opposed to what Pakistan does, is the U.S. did not hesitate to take out the leaders whenever they could. 
I mean, after 9-11. I mean, before 9-11, there, are, there were moments when the U.S. could have taken out bin Laden, but they did not. But the U.S. did target leaders. If you remember the pack of cards with the names of all. But yes. Pakistan is not doing that. That is the only deterrence that you can have against a terrorist organization is to say that we will kill the leaders first, you know, because the leaders are the ones who are making those plans, etc. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of the Pakistani response. I want to turn a little bit towards India's policy towards TTP. Uh, it is very confused as to how some nations are dealing with Afghanistan. I mean, India is not training Taliban diplomats, but we don't recognize the Taliban government. Uh, the embassy is closed, but it is still open with some people operating there. So, so it is as if we are dealing with them, but not dealing with them. So India is <coughs> trying to ensure that China does not fully develop closer relations with Afghanistan. So India is also there. So if there is this hierarchy where TTP is getting support directly or indirectly from uh, the Taliban and India has a good relationship with the Taliban, then what is India's uh, policy towards TTP? And, and in the broader context, is India only opposed to terrorist groups which are anti-India or is India in principle opposed to terrorism and therefore would be opposed to TTP also? Interesting. Absolutely. Very, very interesting. But the fact, let's start by this response by telling you that India has got huge stakes in Afghanistan. After all, the strategic depth of Pakistan, which is what yeah. with Islam Beg used to talk about, right? Uh, if we can have our presence there, if we can erode the Pakistani influence there, it is to our strategic advantage. Uh, we went and we, we, we invested close to $2.5 billion in soft park, built the, the Afghan parliament, built the roads, built hydroelectric stations and things like that. If we do not maintain, maintain a relationship with the Taliban, all this vanishes into thin air. The Taliban equally are very pragmatic. They realize that one of the nations which can make a huge difference here and which is popular with the public is India. India is nearby, close, the proximity is there. Um, it has the capability, it has the technical know-how, it has got the manpower, it's got the money, and it's got the strategic interest. All ingredients required for it. So they have played accordingly. So uh, what has emerged today is essentially a gray zone. It's neither black, neither white, it's a gray zone which is existing. Everyone is looking at this gray zone which is there at the moment. Lots and lots of companies, uh, car countries are functioning in this gray zone. China itself, no one wants to see any other major power come in and you know they have a preponderance of uh, uh, influence over the Taliban government. The Taliban is surviving very largely because of this. I'm sure being financed by, by some elements here and there, by whatever means, that's how it is remaining above board and surviving. Having said all this, um, I'm not sure India would like to get itself involved. It's not had the kind of experience to play proxies, to play proxy war and things like that. While the Americans were there in Afghanistan, India's role was essentially that of soft power. We did not play any proactive military role as such, except for providing security to our own establishments there. Now, suddenly within one year, one and a half years of the Americans leaving, for India to be playing a proactive um, role in this, to my mind, is a little far-fetched. But having said that, there is a world of covert actions. And if covert actions are taking place, I'm sure all over the world countries sure. uh, participate in covert actions. They, can, they, they, they um, further their own interests through uh, covert operations. If that is there, then I'm sure India would probably find favor in that kind of a, a strategy. Of that, one can hardly know anything or one can hardly discuss it. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on the show. And uh, uh, I really learned a lot from you. I hope my audience also enjoyed listening to you. Such thoughtful and interesting uh, uh, analytical conversation. 
Uh, I, I want to wish you a, a belated Eid Mubarak. Uh, and, uh, same to you, same to you. I hope you all had a good Eid in America. This was a very difficult Eid. Both my children are away at college, so we had to drive late at night <laughs> to New Haven. My daughter is uh, studying at Yale, so we, we actually celebrated. Do you all follow the tradition of uh, the Indian Eid, that the South Asian Eid with the Sivanya and uh, things like that? Uh, well, not so much on the sweet part, but yes, <laughs> we, it's very much like the, the Indian. We try to reproduce as much as it possible, except that of the distances, my brothers and sisters are in different cities, and both my kids are now in different cities. But we try our best to 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 go. Well, we wish you. I wish you well. I wish your family very well. And yeah. in the future, if any subjects come up in your Definitely. mind which we could discuss. It would always be my pleasure. Oh, definitely. I will. And uh, I invite uh, everybody who's watching the show to subscribe to Conversations, ring the bell icon, make sure you share uh, the video with uh, your friends uh, and uh, your social network. Uh, sir, thank you very much for joining Conversations. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you.